Welcome to Novelist Spotlight. This is Mike Consul, your host. In addition to being the host of this podcast and interviewing novelists, I am a novelist myself. I have three published novels. My latest is titled Lolita Firestone, a supernatural novel, and it is set in Sedona, Arizona and Cairo, Egypt. My previous novel is titled Family Recipes, a novel about Italian culture, Catholic guilt, and the culinary crime of the century. And my first novel is named Hardwood, a novel about college basketball and other games young men play. And that story deals with issues ranging from depression and racism to sex, religion, and university politics. All three novels are listed in the episode notes. I hope you will buy them, I hope you will read them, and I hope you will thoroughly enjoy them. Now, on with our program. In the spotlight is family therapist, divorce mediator, Broadway and off-Broadway producer, screenwriter and screenwriting teacher, Jennifer Manicharian, who just published her first novel. It's titled Alphabet, and it contains much of her personal and professional life experiences. She co-wrote and produced uh, the film's Family Blues in Boundary Waters. Boundary Waters, I believe, is still in production. We may be talking about that a little bit as well as wrote uh, the book of uh, two musicals that are that are streaming online, Mary Harry, a full-length musical, and Cockroaches in Cologne, a short musical. She is a member of the, of the uh, organization called New York Stage and Film. I could go on from there. Personally, she's married with five children and many grandchildren. You can imagine, uh, just with this interesting background, the kind of source material <laughs> that uh, Jennifer Manicharian had for writing her first novel. And again, that's Alphabet is the name of the novel. And it, it's been described as a resonant tale of love, loss, and learning how to let go. Uh, Beck Garner is a 95-year-old widow. She wakes up one morning and decides to give a dinner party that night for her small family, staff, two neighbors, and a medium. No one knows why the medium's there, but there's a medium. And the story takes place over the course of a day, and is told through multiple points of view, uh, through uh, Bet's guests, switching back and forth between them. And uh, as we learn about their motivations, dreams, hopes, fears, we are um, enmeshed in a wonderful tale. These various storylines end up converging at the dinner table. So you can imagine, I, you know, it brings to, up to me, you know, my, my dinner with on my, I believe it was called my dinner with Andre. That's right. And then also uh, the dinner uh, from uh, Herman Koch, I believe was the, the author. Uh, this sounds very different though. I'm uh, very curious to learn a little bit more about the medium. I, I, I have not read the book yet, but it sounds a, a very interesting. And with that, uh, Jennifer Mancheri, and welcome to the program. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me, Mike. And right. I just have to make a couple of comments based on your long and very generous, nice introduction. Uh, there's one organization I'm part of that I really care about, too. And it's called 18byvote.org, which is getting young people to register to vote. Because having a large family and a lot of grandchildren, I believe everybody has to participate in our democracy. It's just something I care about a lot, but I just want to, and I also want to add that my book is not autobiographical. It's, it may be bits and parts of my life, just events from it, but nothing is directly, uh, there's nothing that's actually I would ever call biographical or there's no one character who really represents anybody. It's more a compilation. Yes, composite characters, situations yeah. that that uh, that uh, you hit oh my gosh. tangentially. I, um, I, I have to apologize. I have to just, I didn't turn this off. I'm getting oh, a that's call. fine. I'm so, uh, on a call. Tell them you're on stage. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's my daughter and I'm sorry. Uh, I just, do, you, do you need to take that or can we just carry on? No, I, I'm, I just sent that to her and I'll, I'll call her back. <laughs> okay. I'm okay, sorry. I hope no, I don't get all. calls from everybody in my family while we're on. <laughs> <laughs> it, it doesn't matter. It's, it's all fine. Let's talk about your being a therapist. You've got this background uh, as a therapist. Uh, how did you, why did you get into the profession? Well, that's a good, uh, you know, I, a lot of things that I have wound up doing in my life haven't been as well thought out as maybe they should have. 
um, I, they kind of just, uh, they, they meet a need at a certain time. What happened was that after my kids, my, I had my youngest, my fifth child when I was about 34 and it was kind of at the height of the women's movement and was, you know, has everybody completely churning, including me trying to figure out how to integrate a, a professional life or a career life with um, having a family. And of course I'm a very hands-on type of person and I wanted to be, I wanted to be there for everybody all the time. I, it was like mission impossible, but in any event, I started working the year I had my youngest, who is the one who just called me. Um, I also started working part-time in public relations. It was a business related to my husband and I was actually, I knew nothing about it. So in a way it really benefited me because I didn't know what you should or shouldn't be doing. So, so I did things that were actually pretty successful, but if I had known more about it, I wouldn't have had the guts to do it. But in any event, the more involved I got, the more I felt like this isn't, you know, I think we got to keep, uh, separate home and family, um, home and work. And so I decided to leave and went back to graduate school and I got a graduate degree, a master's degree, but it wasn't a great degree. And I, I mean, it was, it served me and I wasn't quite sure how, what I was going to do with it, but I wound up taking uh, clinical training in family therapy. And, and I really liked it a lot, so, uh, but um, how did I, I don't know, you know, it was just kind of a fit with me and my outlook in the world, being a family therapist, you know, I'm used to juggling things. I think you have to have a certain, uh, you have to have a certain ability. It's I'm, I am empathetic person, but you also have to, to have the ability to turn off at the end of one hour to go to the next, right? I mean, it's not like you don't care and it's, but there's a certain, I don't know what the word is, like almost like an objectivity you have to have where you have the ability oh, sure. to, to compartmentalize. And, and Yeah, compartmentalize, but you also do divorce mediation, which would, would really require objectivity. Well, um, I, I think there's probably a lot a of men who would think you'd naturally have more uh, in common, well, certainly more in common with the woman, maybe with more empathy for the woman than the man. Well, you know, I, I, I never thought of it in terms of a, a gender, but that you, you may well be right. Um, but you know, it wasn't like these were people. These people came to you off, I'm not off the street, but you know, by referral or whatnot. They were not patients. They were not people that I knew in any way, shape, or form. So I had no particular bias, and and bias wasn't really an issue, but I think that the intensity of divorce mediation is that when people, no matter how settled they are or prepared they are to divorce or how clear they are about it, maybe they've moved on, have other people in their lives. Very few people when they have, when it really comes down to dividing up assets and figuring out what to do with the kids can, um, can do it without any conflict. It, it just raises a lot of issues. I used to feel like I was a policeman <laughs> and I, I, if somebody, I, I don't think I had, I, I don't recall ever people feeling like I wasn't biased. Maybe they felt like I didn't know enough about certain issues that were their issues. Um, and also divorce mediation at the time I was doing, it was a new field. And so, well, you're in California, which was ahead of it because um, they used to have the divorce they used to, re I don't know if they still do it, but they had mandated child custody mediation in California at the time I was doing it. And in fact, I brought somebody in from California to do training with uh, people because I had created a training program. So they, the idea of mediation is more familiar to people in your state, but people didn't really, a lot of people didn't understand um, what mediation was they may have thought you know i would uh was more like a lawyer like a lawyer well, you're trying to avoid a lawyer right and a lot of expenses in 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 a well, in a in a dog fight well what you what well what you're really trying to avoid is that dog fight i mean once you go to lawyers it become it can become very adversarial but at the same time lawyers you've got to be informed you've got to you've got to know what you could be getting or else if you or else you wind up making an uninformed decision and that's not a good decision either 
So basically what we would do would after they either at some point in the process, either in the beginning or in the beginning and or at the end, have them run the, their uh, agreement past a lawyer to make sure there was nothing that was being agreed to that was really way outside the boundaries of what right. would be considered a norm. Because a good agreement is one that everybody can agree to. And, and not everybody can mediate. People who are, you know, really want to kill each other are not going to be able to mediate. No, they want the adversarial lawyer there. Um, yeah. Well, well you know, a lot of people say that many therapists went into the profession because they were trying to, to decode themselves, deconstruct themselves, that they suffered themselves from uh, either a depression or anxiety or personality disorder. And they're trying to figure things out. You seem uh -huh. like a very well-adjusted woman. I don't know that that's the case with you, but well, did, you go into the field? <laughs> did you go well, into the field? Did you go into the field? What are my neuroses? Is that what you're trying to find? Yeah. Out? Well, I mean, I don't know. I, I, you know, I'm meeting you for the first time, really. So, um, well, what was some well, of your own uh, uh, life experiences such that uh, you thought, uh, well, learning about psychology is going to help me solve some of these things? Well, <laughs> I, I would. I've I've certainly had therapy in my life, and I I can't say that I went into it with that in mind. But I but I I guess I am I am kind of a problem solver by nature, and I feel like I have well now having been uh, trained, uh, you know I have a certain training in back of it. But I also feel like I have a natural inclination towards understanding people and and analyzing people and trying to be helpful to people. Maybe it's because I'm a Libra. You know, I have to, I see it. I see both sides of everything. Is that so, right? Is that Lib Libra? That's a characteristic of a Libra. Well, you know, it's the scale where you balance everything. You know, it's hard for me to, I always can see the opposite, the other side of something. In fact, for one of my kids, it used to annoy her when she was little because mom, why do you always have to see the other side? Um, it's, it's kind of an, in, it's kind of ingrained in me. To, to look at things with a certain, you know, to pull, maybe that's part of the writer in me too, you know, kind of pull back and be like the observer and try to see all the different uh, layers. And I always, to me, I mean, fairness is really important. And I, and I always feel like you need all the facts to be, um, to be fair. You can't, you know, a lot of people make knee jerk responses to things. Oh, that person's guilty, you know, something like that. And it's not really the way I think. And, well, if you're a Libra, does that mean your husband's a Sagittarius or a Taurus? Because you're com <laughs> that that's the compatibility there. Are also Aries, I believe you would be compatible with. Well, you're uh, making the assumption that we're compatible. We we haven't agreed on anything and and God knows how many years of marriage. Um, we're not that's, <laughs> that's cuz you're, pa you're you're a passionate couple, so you you fight, <laughs> you have good makeup sex and and uh that can, can carry people through a lifetime. There you go. Well, my husband's Iranian. He was born in Iran. So, you know, we, I had, you know, when we were, I had no idea the amount of cultural differences that would come to play in our marriage, but we've worked it all out. Listen, we've been married a very long time. Now, and does he accept you saying he's Iranian or do you, or does he insist on you saying uh, I'm Persian, not mm -hmm. Iranian, I'm Persian because I know I've known many Iranians and they take great pride in being Persian much more so than being an Iranian. No, it's not an issue, but I did read something about that just the other day. I don't know. I am I, we haven't really had that kind of a distinction. You know, there was a time, well, even now in this country being an Iranian, particularly after the, uh, in the, what, around 1980, when there was uh, the hostages. The hostage crisis, that, yeah. You know, saying you were Iranian wasn't such a great, I was bad, but yeah. um you know, Iranians, they have a very deep and rich culture. And it's yes. it's really, it's a very interesting mix. But in any event, my point is that uh, seeing things from different points of view, I always like, I mean, I like to know everything. I don't, I don't make quick judgments. I like to, I like to be, I think I'm but very- But this is what you do in your novel. In your novel, you show multiple points of view. Um, yeah. You have interest in people and you- and I do, you I Characters. And you see these different uh, points of view. Um, Character so, and stories are interesting to me. I like people's yes. stories. And I always like, you know, one time when I did see a therapist, and it was more than once, um, I don't mean to imply it was only once, but once a therapist <laughs> said something to me that was one of the, one of the best things that was ever said to me, um, because it really 
it really helped me. And that was uh, when when there was an argument with somebody saying, what's after listening to me, you know, piss and moan, she said, what's your 50 percent? And, you know, you don't you never want to hear that. You know, you want somebody to be aligned with you. But that forced me to go back and to really look at my own behavior. And well, what, what, did, what did she or he mean by your 50 percent? In other words, what's your part in all this? You, you oh, know, you okay. can blame somebody else, but, but you know, uh, you know, you can't fight in a vacuum. There has to be somebody else has to, you know, takes two to tangle, as they say. Yeah. And and you make a choice. I mean, that's one of the things I didn't get really early in life was that you, the, the, the both partners are always to blame on some level. And I said, well, how's that? And it, well, you picked her, you picked her. So well, that's a choice that, that you made. And that, yes. that, so it's partly your fault because you obviously don't have good judgment if you, if she's really not good. I mean, I've well, been divorced twice, so I'm on my third wife, huh. but and third and last, I should say. Well, well, I hope so. How long is that? What, how long has this marriage been? Well, it's been 12 years uh, so far, oh. but in my so previous one was, was, yeah, 20, 25 before that. And the first one but was I just don't... a couple of years, but, no, but, but you it, know what? It, Let me ask hard. you one more. Oh, go ahead. Finish that. I'm sorry to interrupt, but it's not about making a bad choice. It's about understanding, you know, we know what we know what pushes somebody else's buttons. You know, when you talk about what's your part in something, you know, we can we can always act like there's a little halo around us. I mean, but there's always I mean, I, I even felt with my kids, you can always even though one of them may look like the underdog, like the younger child or whatever. You can be sure that kid has done something to aggravate the older kid. Yes. And that's, that's the thing. And I tell people, I mean, this is something I learned early in life. Look, I'm I, I'm a New Yorker, an Italian, seven, one of seven s- siblings. You can imagine the chaos and dysfunction going on. <laughs> I learned early in life that if somebody says something to get you, don't react to it because you're rewarding them and they will keep pushing that button. If you don't react, you're not rewarding them. But there's a lot of people, I'm sure you've seen yeah. many in your lifetime, who have no control of their emotions and they react. And they and yes, they and, set and themselves you take, up. You take all the fun out of it when you when you don't react. Exactly. So they'll move on to somebody else who who they can who's who yeah. will react. I have one more question for you about uh, psychology, and that is, I'm just curious who your favorite psychologist was. Was it was it Maslow? Was it uh, was it um, Carl Jung? Was it? Um, <laughs> You know, I'm I am a family therapist. We're it's systems therapy. It's like you know, it's understanding things within the context of not just of the individual, but of the family system. But you studied Skinner and 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 uh, R. D. Lang yeah. and the rest of them, right? Yeah, but that's you know, it's that's in you know, much more into psychoanalysis and and thinking about things in that way. And I I I don't like to. I mean, we all do it naturally without meaning to, but I try not to interpret people's behavior if I can and try to take to some extent them at face value. Now, I mean, it's it's an ideal. It's not like I always do that. But sometimes, you know, it's a real problem when you make you become, you, you know, you make a decision about somebody and, and kind of what makes them tick and you don't really hear what they're saying. And, you know, in family therapy, you know, part of what you do in family therapy, well, it's true in any therapy, but there's an initiate, there's an, an you know, an, an, an initiation. And that's not the right word I want, but there's a process in the beginning where you're going to get people come in. Oh my God, help me. This person, this, back, you know, I, I need help. I right. can't respond to that. You have to, you have to allow yourself to kind of move, I was going to say move the camera back. That's, I guess, my film imaging. But to, to sit back and to listen to all the different, uh, get all the history, find out the history. Very often there's family patterns and patterns that may be at play that people don't see themselves. You want to get, when you're listening to just one person, you don't really get a full perspective. I mean, when I'm, when, let's say I gave the example, like when you go to your individual therapist and you're complaining about somebody, you're not getting that other 50%. You're, you're just hearing that person's point of view about it. Yes. Uh, but family therapy is a much, it's a much more all encompassing where you're looking at all the players and you're kind of trying to pick up patterns and what's going on. And, you know, there's so many patterns that get repeated through generations. And so it's, it's a different form of therapy and, and, 
you know, I, one of the people who I, who has written about it and was kind of my mentor as a woman, she's no longer alive, Betty Carter, who was a family therapist. She had an Institute where I used to work and she, uh, she, I, she was really more than anything, the person who guided my thinking in terms gotcha. of as a gotcha. therapist. So Betty used, Carter. Yeah, we used to, I mean, we shared something called the family life cycle. That was one of her textbooks, but you would, you would, you know, we used to work, uh, we used to, when in training, we used to have to sit in a room with a family or the individual, but usually it was more than one person. And there would be trainees in the other side of the mirror or, or people listening to our thing and, and helping us <laughs> to get perspective about it. It's, it's really uh, now fascinating. That I, well, it's an interesting process and the kids will be, you know, particularly if you have kids in the room who you're, who are part of a family, you know, they'll see the shiny, they don't see the people in back, but, but they see that they know there's a camera and they'll be waving it, <laughs> you know, but in no time at all, you get caught up in a conversation. You forget they're there. Exactly. I remember I was seeing, I was uh, doing therapy with uh, my, I, it was marital counseling with my, my second wife. And uh, our therapist said, why don't you run a, a recorder? And we were feeling like, well, we're not going to be the same people if there's a record. She goes, yeah, in the beginning you won't, but you're going to forget about it in no time. And you're going to be acting very naturally. And all of a sudden it'll dawn on you, oh, we've got it recorded now. And I've got something, uh, well, you've got something to work with and I've got something to work with. At any rate, um, when you wake up in the morning, Jennifer, what do you tend to be thinking about? Is anything I've consistent there or is it all over the map? Other than having to go to the bathroom? Yeah, other uh, than that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I I am elderly. I'm thinking about my body. <laughs> it, you know, I got to get out of bed. But so you, I, do you do an inventory on your body? Do you kind of feel like if there's aches and pains? Uh... No, no. I, my body bores the hell out of me. In fact, I think that I think what distinguishes uh, when you know you're getting older is when you even know you have a body. I mean, it's a, it's really a bore. I mean, so I, I don't think about it very much. Basically, I... Well, how old are you, uh, Jennifer? You really can I ask? Old? Can I ask 80, that question? 85. 85. Wow, you're in tremendous energy and shape uh, for, yeah, for uh, I, the, that in, number. I'm, I'm in shock myself. <laughs> I can't believe I I just I don't think like I'm 85 and most of the people I'm around are younger. I mean, it's just hard for me to believe, but it's yeah. what it's what it's what the uh, calendar tells me. And no, I wake up in the morning. I always I mean, I I can't wait to get back to what I'm working on. It's like I really I, that's basically where my head is. And in fact, it's when I go to so bed, you wake up night. motivated. You wake up motivated. I do. Uh, I wake and, up and every I was gonna day. I was going to ask you what you were just about to say when you go to sleep at night, what are you thinking about or doing? It's the same thing. I'm usually trying to think about, um, I mean, right now I'm in the process of trying to write my second book. I've got, you know, maybe a third of it done. And I, if there's, there's something that I can't figure out and I'm trying to work it out, it'll be in my head, like as a problem I want to try to solve. And I'll just, I'll do that the same thing. It, when I'm in my car, wherever I am, I mean, I, I really have trouble. I'm very um, obsessive, to be honest with you. So you let I these mean, thoughts incubate, these these problems, oh, yeah. ideas, they incubate people. Oh, There's I, a technique of going to bed at night, um, thinking about your problem, whatever problem it might be, or something you needed to solve. And in the morning, you have an answer. Do you find that to be the case some of the time? Well, I don't know that I have. I I. I no, I don't find that, but but it is true. When I try, I fall asleep quickly, more quickly than I want to, because if it's something with my kids or with my husband, if it's something I'm trying to figure out, I definitely, um, I mean, if I'm in the car, it'll be really helpful, very constructive. Um, but I feel like when I'm falling asleep, if I have a work, you know, in my book, for example, I'm trying trying to figure something out about this character, and. Uh, I'll just keep, I'll just keep working at it. In fact, a lot of how I, my, my writing and how I think about it, I feel like it. And I, this is what I tell people I work with too. I think these characters have to be so internalized. You have to be so clear about who they are uh, that it's almost like when you go to write about them, it's, I'm, it certainly doesn't write itself, but 
but there's a but you have a sense of who they are and how they respond in situations, how they talk, what they do, what they wear, what their furniture <laughs> looks like. I I work a lot inside my head on anything I'm doing really before I'm writing it. Let's talk about, now you mentioned you're working on your second novel. Let's talk about that first novel. Why did you decide to write a novel? You're a screenwriter, you produce, you have lots of things going on in your life, but you decided that you wanted to write a novel. What what well, motivated you to do so? Well, that's a good question. I mean, you could say I'm scattered. I don't, it, I don't think it's that I'm scattered so much as that I have a lot of things that I like to do. I'm kind of like the jack of all trades. I don't know that I am a master at any, but I like trying different things. Um, and a friend of mine who's a, who's a fiction writer was reading a, leading a group about 10 years that was like two hours every other week. So I figured, okay, I got two hours. And so I joined the writing group and it was really for short stories and stuff. And I didn't know if I would be any good at writing uh, narrative fiction. And, I really liked it. I enjoyed it a lot. I mean, I never thought I, I mean, I never thought I could even write a 500 word story. And as I got better at it, I didn't know that I could write a thousand word story, but I never thought that I would write a novel ever. It just, it just didn't occur to me, but this, but I got involved with uh, screenwriting teaching as well. And a lot of the people who are the teachers there became my friends. And we created a, we have a writing group that every year we spend about, it's maybe at this point, it can be between six and eight people. We do a, we do an annual retreat in Cape Cod where we do nothing but write and, you know, talk to each other about what we're working on and getting ideas. So some of the things I've been working on in my, that little group, I was thinking, I started to develop stories about different people. And at some point I came up with the idea of somehow mingling these people finding a way to integrate them but it wasn't really uh i i it was such a huge undertaking i didn't really think that i'd have the ability to do it but then we had something called a pandemic where we were uh, theater shut down and my office closed and all of mm. a sudden i had a you know i was home every day i wasn't commuting which meant that i saved up to two hours a day in, on the road and and I was, uh, I just made a decision to kind of see what I got and see where I can take it. And so it, I, I don't think it would have happened without the pandemic, but I got very into it. And it was, a, it was a huge undertaking. And the people who are in my writing group, they all read a couple of drafts each and they're, they're all published writers and they all had different notes for me. And it was, I'm, I really take notes well, you know, I'm not, I, I'm trying not to be defensive. I try, I try to hear what's going to make something better rather than hold on to what I've done. Right. Well, what they is were, the, Oh, go ahead. What, what did they say? Or what but, I say? mean, they, they were so helpful to me, but when I got it to a point where I couldn't go any further, I made a decision to hire a developmental editor, which is what I, which is what it would have happened if I had decided to go a more traditional route of trying to get an agent and a publisher, but I didn't want to put the type type of time into that that I would have maybe if I were uh, 60 or something because I'm I'm too old I don't want to waste it I don't want to spend five years doing something that may never happen right um, but what so about I heard... a developmental editor talk, talk about um now th in other words this is a person who helped you develop the story structure it um assisted with maybe pacing and all of that okay uh, talk about that a little bit well it's there I, I'm I wish I could be articulate about describing what what she does. I mean, most people, most books will go through that process. I mean, an agent will have you go through one. A, a publisher may also, you know, very often. Very, I don't know how often the finished product is something they're ready to to publish as is. I mean, no matter what, you need a copy editor for grammar and everything. But a development developmental editor basically kind of pulls back and looks at the story as a whole. Is it, you know, what is the uh, does it is the does it flow from you know once one beat to another is it is it repetitive are there too many characters i mean one of the things i had to do was to take out two characters two whole stories 
from the dinner uh, party itself. So you had a, a slim yes. down the invite list. Okay. Yeah. What, well, what, initially what I had, yeah, initially I had two additional characters who I, who I removed. She also made a suggestion to me, which, uh, won't make much sense to anybody who hasn't read the book but in the book there's an the old lady her she's a widow and her husband is very much on her thoughts and he had died like five years earlier and she had suggested that i find a way to connect him to all the different characters who are going to be at that dinner table so that it kind of gave a common thread and it's they have other ways of joining but this was kind of everybody had that in common so I mean, I thought it was a great suggestion. I I followed almost. So this is the hostess. Said. This is the hostess. Uh, this is um. This, this is, is the, the husband of the host, and practically, and you know, so it's all the connections that other people who were in that small world had in uh, in common with with her her dead husband. They all had in some way been connected to him. Well, first of all, some two of them were family, but. Uh, everybody had a sense of who he was and it, it just made, it brought him into the story in a way that was uh, much From better than I initially thought of because initially I had him, this is before I went to, to her, the developmental editor, but it was in the very beginning. I had the husband whose name is George as a character. And I had him like supposedly from wherever one goes kind of um, floating around and, you know, dancing with Ginger Rogers and stuff. <laughs> and, and, and when somebody had said to me, you know, it's really tricky to do a prologue uh, number one. And number two, if you're going to be creating an alternative world, so to speak, you have to really be clear on what those rules are. And I really, I took that to heart and made a decision that, that it wasn't a good idea to have him in that sense, a character. So by bringing him into everybody else's story, because while it's the story of everybody's life in the course of 24 hours, it also goes into all of their backstories. And there's ways in which you get to know, you know, who they are as people, aside from what they're doing during that 24 hour period. Is this where the medium comes into play? Is the medium integral or integral to? Well, the medium, the medium, I'm not going to tell you too much. about. Oh, okay. Them. Yeah. I was going to say I, that maybe that's never. A, well, Bet goes to the medium at one point. You never, you don't ever know what goes on in that closed door, and the medium is invited also to the dinner party. But you, but it's something where, but not to hold have, a seance. You will have to. Well, I'm not going to. You tell have you to that. read it. You have to read it. Yeah, no, this is no, no, yes. I, no spoiler alerts here. We're just not going to spoil it. No, um, we don't. Are you into but, the paranormal at all? Do you well, meditate? Do you believe in the metaphysical? Are you spiritually inclined? Do you believe in ghosts? Do you believe on anything that's beyond the, the you know, secular, physical uh, Well, world? I don't think that meditating is the same as believing in the paranormal. No, but no. I think meditating- But you might be reaching good. across for that purpose. Well, uh, meditating no. Meditating to reach across. I'm a very impatient person. I don't know if that comes across. I'm not good at meditating, um, but- I do. I, I don't, I don't, I'm kind of an agnostic. Um, I don't know what's real and what isn't real. And mm -hmm. I, I'm uh, so I don't have a, I don't have a clear point of view. I take, I, one of the, one of the characters in the book has night terrors and I, I have had them for years. I'm not at the moment. Thank God I'm not having them, but I have, I have had the experience of, you know, actually like seeing a, a child right next to me. It's weird. I've had, you know, really, I've been very frightened by images that come to me. I don't know what that's about. Um, During your wake, waking consciousness? No, no. This is in dreams. Asleep. I wake up from a sleep terrified. Gotcha. I mean, a night terror is very different from a nightmare. If you look up the difference, they're quite different. There's a phenomenon that people have who get night terrors where it, the pattern is very similar. You come out, you come out, you know, you, it's something that's so real and it comes with it a tremendous fear. It can be just a sensation or it can be something I'm seeing or it can be something, whatever. It, it, usually for me, it's like a sense that I'm about to die and I get, I scream bloody murder. Um, my husband wow. is, it's, it, I haven't, as I said, it's been some, I remember one time I woke, I was with my sister and <laughs> I woke up screaming and my sister is very practical. She said, I said, we're going to die. Come, come on, come with me. We're going to die. 
She said, we are going to die, but it's not going to be tonight. And I have to go to the bathroom and go back to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> talk, and, talk, talk about, um, did you want to say something else about that before I, I get to the difference between screenwriting and novel writing? Well, no, I just want to say one thing. And it's really weird because a lot of people find cats weird and I've always had cats. But sometimes my my cats will be on my bed. I sleep with my cats. And all of a sudden they'll act like crazy. You know, it's like they've seen something. So I don't I don't know what to make of things. You know, there mm. are things that happen. That's the kind of thing that I find almost spooky. Um Yes. My so husband when they're my picking husband, something up that they that you don't and you're not you don't know what it is that they're picking no. up. No. And I'll tell you, one time one of my granddaughters had had asked me to go with her on a walking tour in the city. With there was a German woman who had invented some kind of earphones that would pick up sounds that you could never ordinarily hear. And we walked for a few blocks around uh, Penn Station, and with these earphones on, and you wouldn't believe what you can hear. What I could hear that I could never, you know, the sounds were unbelievable. And in fact, if you came near like a neon sign in a store, it was so painful you had to take it off. So who knows? You know, that's just in terms of auditory. Wow. Yeah. Who knows what else? What else is going on that we just can't access? I mean, it was it was a very eye opening experience as to the amount of noise that goes on all around us that we have no awareness of. Exactly. Exactly. There's, there's just so many, yeah. you know, um, 200 years ago, if you had told people there's these invisible waves in the air and someday we're going to carry music and, and audio <laughs> over them, they would have locked you up. Uh, well, but it, it existed it was, and we didn't know it was there. We didn't know it was I mean, there or that we could generate it. I mean, how do you and I talk on a, you know, you're on a wire and I'm on, I mean, it's nothing makes sense to me. I don't I don't know enough about the that kind of, you know, the engineering world to understand any of it. But I mean, I wanted to just give you a little insight. One time my husband, his brother had died and they had kind of said one of them would give a signal that the other died first. And my husband was looking in the mirror. He was shaving and he said, you know, to his brother, OK, if anything's real, send me a signal right now. And like something fell off of a shelf. Now, is that. <laughs> What does that mean? Is that my husband's own psychic energy that moves things? I, I don't know what to make of things like that. So when you ask me the question, I don't I don't believe and I don't disbelieve. Right. Yeah. You suspend judgment. Okay. Well, let's talk about screen. Here you are a professional screenwriter. And then you decide I'm going to write a novel. The pandemic kind of opened the door for you on the novel writing. How big a difference? Um Talk talk about making the leap from screenwriting to novel writing, which which contains so much more information. What was that like? How big a struggle it's, was it? it? It was a struggle. It was definitely a struggle, and it was a good. I'm glad you said that word. It's a different craft, and and it's. I mean, when I wrote the first movie that I did, which is called Family Blues. I mean, I I didn't. You know, I'm a do-it-yourselfer, so. You know, we just I and I did it with my son. We just plunged in and I didn't know much about the craft of screenwriting, which I've had to learn over the years. And it's it's, you know, learning how, you know, how to use the camera, how much, you know, how much you the camera work the camera can do for you, how dialogue is very different. I mean, it's the movie dialogue is quite different, but dialogue is something that's pretty comes pretty naturally to me. Maybe it's because I have a kind of a pretty good sense of character and understanding of character and how people behave in situations. But so, you know, I had to, I mean, had to learning how to make, you know, scenes are short. Each scene has to move something forward. Movie making is really economical and there's nothing that's gratuitous and it has to feel like it's all organic, <laughs> which is not so easy to do. Uh, but I mean, that's one type of crap. But but writing a book that when when somebody said to me early on, this reads kind of like a play, I, I realized the extent to which I had to learn how to kind of set the stage in a way that wasn't easy for me. It's not just when you're writing a scene where you have dialogue. It's that in between interspersing with dialogue. You know, you have somebody answering the phone or getting a Kleenex or interrupting or, you know, there's so there's so much more that gets filled in between 
just line, 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 line. Am I making any sense to you? You are. Let me let me kind of try to focus this in a little bit. What can a if somebody was to ask you, what can a novelist learn from screenwriting, like by reading screenplays, let's say, uh, what would you say? Oh my God, what a question! Well, I think a novelist. Um, I, I mean, I think if you're a novelist or a screenwriter, you got to really have you, you got to understand character comes. You've really got to know your characters. I'm that's kind of my my base, <laughs> knowing your characters. Char plot follows characters. You got to know who they are to know what they're doing. But I think that when you in in a in a book, you can have much longer scenes with dialogue, but but in a play it's in a script excuse me in a script it's so much more concise the dialogue has to be so so specific to that particular scene that just kind of drives you to to the next scene drives you forward whereas a novel takes much more time with that um and and one of the things that you you know for example if you want to introduce backstory in a novel you know you you can do it any way you know it's not that hard to do you find out you know where that story fits and you write it in a screenplay you have to be really careful not to be too on the nose and to kind of introduce information that that they're never going to see but that will be that will help you understand that character i'm going to give you an example there's a movie that i think is a good movie just in terms of teaching the economy of screenwriting and it's by uh, it's called the confirmation it's by i think his name's richard nelson oh god i'm sorry my cat just jumped on me mm. and in in it there's a scene where this guy who's kind of um it's really early on in the movie it may be the first dialogue in the movie he's kind of a it's clive owen and he's kind of beat up and he's going to uh meet he's going to pick up his kid for the weekend and his ex-wife meets him in front of the church where she's handing him over. Now, the church, she's going on some marital weekend with her husband, and he's not exactly <laughs> the most church-loving guy. And he's also been a, an alcoholic. And she says, she says to him, if you screw up one more time, you're not going to see this kid again. Now, how much history do you get in a line like that? I mean, we're not going to find out. We're not going to see him as, you know, we're not going to see anything about their marriage in the past. But we know that we know the history of their marriage in one line. Mm. Mm. We basically, you know, it's like, it, but whereas in a novel, there's a lot you can explain in terms of that. Um, you have you have much more room to kind of explore things, but you it can, it doesn't have to be that economical. Right. But the danger and, is that you because you have all the all the latitude that you do in writing a novel that, that you could over explain things. Well, then then you're going to get a nice editor who's going to tell you your, you know, uh, show don't tell. You know, it, this sounds too much like it's, you know, a summary or this sounds like I mean, I get I I got my share of that. And that's when you go back and you work on it and you make it more story like rather than just information. So would you be more intimidated starting a new screenplay or starting a new novel? Which, which is a more arduous task? Well, I don't think that I think of it in those terms. I think it's more do what do I, what is, where is my passion right now? Which one do I feel like it's something I have to write? I don't, I don't know that I feel that one is more arduous than the other so much as one, I feel impelled to be writing one at a particular time. I mean, like now I'm, I'm dying to write my second novel is, and, and instead I have to be marketing it. <laughs> I had no idea that I was going to have this year. As you've said, I'm not exactly young. I've had to learn so much this year. I mean, I made a movie. We filmed it in Minnesota in May and I was a producer on it as well as a writer. And the amount I've learned in terms of producing a film this year, I mean, I feel like I've, I've had a whole course in that. I've also been uh, had to learn how to market it, which is my book, which has really been tough. And I've had to also, since it was published through a hybrid publisher, had to go through a lot of the process of making decisions and learning how to do uh, get the book out and do it right. So, I mean, it's been is a Boundary year. Waters, 
Boundary Waters is the movie that you just it's, referenced. Yeah, it's it, yes, it's the, yes, because it was filmed. Boundary Waters uh, is a reference to the area where we filmed it, which was in, um, ooh, like in northwestern uh, Minnesota. Mm -hmm. It's a very beautiful part. And, and we filmed it in this little uh, town of 3,000 people. And it, it was just, it was really an amazing experience. Uh, when is that going to come out? Well, we're not, we're hoping to, we're doing the festival route. We're waiting to hear on a couple of major festivals. Mm -hmm. And so I don't have an answer for that, but we have a, it's a very good film. It's really basically um, to try to boil it down to a sentence or two. It's, it's really the impact of trauma uh, on a family and a community as seen through the eyes of a 12 year old boy. And, you know, so it's about, it's not about, the trauma itself or, or what are the, or whoever did what to whom, but it's, it's all about the fallout. And there's a lot of, you know, you, there's, there's less, you read a lot about stories where there's been uh, sexual violence or whatever. And it's really about the, both the criminal and the victim and the trial and everything else. This really just focuses on a little boy and how he's affected by what's happened to his mom. Mm. Tell me about, um, so you're working on this, well, you pr pretty much finished this movie up. You're looking to go to to some of the festival, uh, yeah. film festivals. You're working on your second novel. Uh, what can you tell us about the second novel without giving it away or, or jinxing yourself? <laughs> well, I don't want to jinx myself. Um, I, I'm also working on a, a musical where I have a character named Jinx. and <laughs> But <laughs> I, I like that I, name. Yeah, I, it's just funny to me, and it, it kind of fits, fits what her life has been. But um, the second novel is basically the main character. It is a character from the first novel who I just have fun writing, and that's really why I like to write about her. She's really unpleasant. And in fact, when I f took my writing, as I said, I started with a writing group years ago, and we have writing prompts. And one of the prompts was to write about an unpleasant person. And this wasn't the person I wrote about, but it was, it's an amazing experience to write about somebody who's unlikable because, you know, it's, we always want people to be redeemed in some way and to write about somebody who's not that, I mean, ultimately you have to find their humanity, which I hope I do in this person. She's like the next door neighbor, but. Next door I, neighbor I, to bet. Yes. She's, she's just, a really nasty woman and she's funny. I, I mean, I find her, I laugh when I, I'm sorry. I have a very weird sense of humor. And so. It's because you're not, a New Yorker. I the same thing with me. I laugh at things. And my wife says, why, what, what's funny about that? And I said, it's just the, <laughs> it's just the way it happened. The physicality of it, or the way it was said. I oh, get I exactly have, what you mean. Oh, so I go ahead. I'm sorry. I interrupted rap. you. But. No, but in my, Oh my God, I have a terrible, my sense of humor gets me in a lot of trouble. But I don't laugh at things people laugh at normally. I just laugh at other things. At any rate, this woman is just nasty and racist, and it's just kind of funny. But uh, she's an interesting character to me. So basically, I, I want to go back and revisit her and find out even more about, you know, why she is the way she is and, and how she can redeem herself. Is there an and, overarching theme to the book that you can say, or, or is that? Uh, to the, to the right one now. I'm going to be writing, well, the yeah, arc, the one you're working on. Well, I guess I would have to say the the arc of it's going to somehow be, uh, you know how how she. I don't know if I want to say. Uh, That's okay. Don't say it then, because I, I don't want you to regret uh, later that you said it. Is Beth no. going to be in the book at all, or not? Well, no, she's not. She's okay. going to be somebody they talk about, but she's not going to be in the book because it's kind of moved. It's kind of moved past her. Why is the title of your first novel Alpha Bat as an alpha female or? or... Yeah, alpha. She's, you know, I have dogs. I know which is the alpha. Um, and, you know, we have alpha people, too. Um, you know, mm -hmm. she's a tough. She's tough. She's, you know, well, my mother was, too, like ferociously independent down to down to the end um she's and when i'm I, it was very hard coming up with it i mean nobody's ever heard of me and 
And I, to come up, I, I felt like it was really important for me to have a good cover. Have you seen the cover? Oh, I love the cover. I, I yeah. was going to ask you if you were involved in the cover design because yeah. I love the cover. Well, I really, I really, I mean, that's part of my, con I guess, my need for control where I wanted to self-publish because sometimes when you work with traditional publishers, you don't have, you have a say, but you don't have the final word. And I felt very strongly that I needed a really strong cover and I needed a great title. And so I, uh, I worked, I had the, I got the title first. And from that, I worked with the, the art, the design people. I mean, I didn't do it all by myself, but I, cause I, I'm not that I'm good at design actually. Uh, but I'm, I, I just had very specific ideas as to what it had to look like. Are you happy with it? I love it. I'm I do too. Of now, for I, I, I'm sending it out. I will be sending it out through social media to help promote the podcast. Oh, if you're you. listening to this right now on uh, on uh, YouTube, then you see it there along with Jennifer's photograph. Uh, right, it's already got 58 reviews on on uh, Amazon and four and a half stars. So uh, you're off to a good start here. It's a it's it's a sharp looking. Uh, she's 95, remember, and she's got all the lines to prove that she has lived life. She's got a pair of glasses on, and you see only half of her face, but uh, she looks like somebody you don't want to mess with. Um, well, they presented me with that profile, and I, but I, I changed her glasses color. I changed her ear. You know, I made, I made a number of changes. And actually, I had gone to AI and looked up. I kind of gave the synopsis of the book, and I, and I, I put in some ideas, and I put Hockney. And I want because I love the Cockney's co colors that, you know, they're very vibrant, you know, like that swimming pool and everything. And the, and I got kind of the color palette from a from that Hockney painting. Wow. But yeah. I also but the title, her name was not Bet at the time I came with, up with it. And I, I took me. I mean, I really I kept asking. I got so many suggestions for the title. It took me a long time. I mean, dinner party, stuff like that. It seemed very I, I needed a title that was just that kind of caught you and stayed with you and once i came up with the alpha part of it i changed her name i changed her name many times anyhow but that's when i changed her name uh to, to make it fit alphabet so that you could just you could remember that name and i like it i i think that i it was like it too i like it too and i like your the cover is great it's definitely an attention grabber if somebody was just uh being uh kind of um spontaneous trying to be serendipitous and just looking at book covers i could see them grabbing this one and starting to thumb through the pages to uh to see is this is this for me um so i'd say you scored on that one for sure you and your publishing company um talk about um as long as you are a screenwriter and you've been steeped in in broadway in 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 hollywood um oh not really, but not, not really not Hollywood. Good. But I mean, you are, I'm sure, a cinemaphile. If I ask you to name a few movies that you think are based on truly great screenplays, uh, and I say movies rather than plays because more people tend to see movies because they're, they're, you know, they're not having to be live, they can be distributed, they're scalable easily. Uh, are there a few movies that you would uh, name that you would say those are just outstanding screenplays? Movies based on screenplays? I'm not sure what you mean by that question. You mean just movies? Movies, uh, it, where the screenplay was outstanding. I mean, the screen, that, that the, it starts with the writing, right? Well, if you see that, yes. Yes, it starts with, I mean, and it needs a great director who also probably shapes the script and also uh, casts it and everything else. I mean, actually, I saw a movie yesterday that is it's going to be a contender. And as much as I say, I think I laugh at a lot of things. Uh, I didn't think it was, it's called laugh out loud funny. And I didn't find it funny. I found it really sad, but so well done. And that's the holdovers. Oh, I saw it. My wife and I love that movie. And did you find it funny or did you? Well, find it, it had, sad? it had its moments, but it was um, very, there was a lot of sadness. A I mean, that sadness. kid looking at that kid. I mean, so this abandoned kid, I mean, it, I just didn't find it very funny, but, the, but powerful, yes, we're, powerful and meaningful. I mean, yeah. I recommend I would certainly recommend it to people. Oh, yeah. uh, there's a lot all. of people who don't like to go see sad movies, but this is sad in a way that, you know, it, it reaffirms your humanity. 
Well, yes, but if you went to see that movie thinking it was a great comedy, you'd be, it's, it reminds me of Ter Terms of Endearment, which was another wonderful movie, which was sold as a comedy, but in the middle of it, you know, a young woman gets cancer and dies. Yeah. I mean, that's not that funny. <laughs> no, no. I, I, I didn't find it to be funny. Well, I mean, it did have its moments, but it was definitely, I mean, Larry McMurtry was the guy who wrote the novel. He His novels are brooding. They're brooding yeah, sort of totally. novels. Yeah. And I'll tell you another, I mean, a movie, this goes back a long time, but something like As Good As It Gets, I thought that was fabulous. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. With Jack Nicholson. Yes. Um, also about Schmidt. Did you ever see about Schmidt? Yeah. With yeah. Jack Nicholson? That's another it's, one that's a, with Jack it has Nicholson. its funny moments, but it's, it's you know, these are movies, These are, well, I, to me, the movie is interesting. I mean, most comedies are stupid and I, I just mm -hmm. don't respond to them. I don't, I'm not good at, I don't find those type of movies where, you know, slapstick or whatever, they don't amuse me. Well, and they're to so I, predictable. They're completely yeah, predictable. Totally. I love a movie where you don't know what's going to happen. There were, you know, there's a French movie I really loved, and it was also based on a book. And it, it has an ending, and I won't say what it is, but it, it was, to me, I was shocked by it. And then it, after I thought about it more, I thought it was amazing. And that's called The Hedgehog. And it's also a book. And, you know, another movie that I, when we're talking about it is that's very similar thematically to art, to the movie Boundary Waters. It's called Close. And it's a European film. It's uh, and the composer for that film is the same composers we have who who really made reached out to do the music for our film because he who wanted would that to be? Do his name is Valentin. I cannot say his last name to save my life. H A D J Hajat, or I can't say it properly. I'm I'm just going to spoil it. But the movie Close, it, well, it's a very sad film. It, I not mean, not to be confused with Closer, right? There's another no. movie with Clive Owen called Closer. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Julia Roberts. I saw that as a play in London many years ago. No, it's nothing like that. It's about okay. a young adolescent boy who. Um, has a, a friendship that other kids start teasing them uh, with horrible repercussions. Uh, and mm. and it's it's about the same idea of the fallout of something that happens. But it's uh, beautifully done. And one of the things that I read somewhere that the director had such a hard time finding that kid. And finally, he was on a train one day going to Europe somewhere, somewhere in Europe. And he saw this kid on the train and he asked the parents if he could stream cast the kid who'd never been an actor. And they and he was the kid in the movie and he's a beautiful young boy. And in fact, in the holdovers, that kid came from the school also. He wasn't a, he was a, not a professional actor. But he's in the movie. The In the holdovers. Yeah. The kid who's in that movie, the main kid. He That's was a him. student that. He was a student at St. Paul's when they went to look at the school and they, and they found him. Oh, wow. I had no idea. And, wow. Yeah. And I just I was got so curious. I read up about him and he's going to Carnegie Mellon to get it, you know, get his acting chops. I mean, it's very impressive after being in that movie that he's now in college in order to get uh, more more craft. Yes. Yes. Talk about your creative regimen. And I know that you have these ideas, characters, scenes that incubate you know, day and night, but when you actually sit down to do the writing, do you have a regimen? Are you up at, uh, you know, four in the morning, five in the morning, six in the morning and spend two, three hours? How do you do, do what you do? What, what works okay. for you? Well, I, what works for me is basically my husband wants, I mean, we never, I mean, I usually get up before the pandemic in the morning, we have, we are on very different schedules and he, uh, he has a slow morning and I would just get up and want to get going. I wanted to get in my car in the morning. I'm, you know, ready to go, but, but he likes, we, we now have breakfast together, which is, which I don't know if we ever did that before. So I can't, I don't really start till nine 30 when he goes on a call and then I'm up here and I have to practically be carted away at the end of the day. It's I'm very, I, I have, I'm, I don't really know when I've had enough and I can sit here all, all day. I don't have any problem with motivation. So I, I basically, I'll go downstairs at some point and I'll make myself lunch, bring it back up. And maybe at a, around six or so I'll go downstairs and, you know, make dinner. But otherwise if, if I lived alone, 
I probably work 12 hours a day. So you're working a lot of hours. Uh, I mean, I, you know, it's not, I, I, it's just my personality. I don't know what to say. I mean, it's like, you don't know when it starts or you, you probably don't even know when it ends. Well, okay. I don't, you know, I, I love what I do. So I'm not, it's not like I'm suffering. I mean, right. you know, people say, why don't you slow down? Well, I, listen, I've had, by the time I was 27, I had four kids and a nephew living with us. I mean, I've, I've, I've haven't, I've never slowed down. And then by the time my kids were grown and out of the house, I had my parents and my life has always been kind of go, go, go. And I, the that's thing what you that, enjoy. Well, what'll stop me would be, I guess my health. And, and I don't, fortunately, I'm really lucky. I have good health and I don't, I'm very motivated. So the only thing that I don't know what's going to stop me unless i same I, thing that I, stops us all <laughs> yeah, our yeah, health and, uh, yeah, and the, potentially the our extinction reaper, the grim reaper but yeah then, well hopefully i'll feel this this way always my keep my older sister keeps telling me well you wait till you get a little older you'll lose it all i mean i'm not hope i'm hoping she's wrong yes exactly um so you and your husband are at a stage in life where you're sitting down and having breakfast together do you what do you talk about or is it really more just being together just being in each other's presence well we may talk about the news i'm uh although that's i i you know what i start in the morning i have about eight people or nine people that every morning i send some kind of a cheerful instagram thing to because it all started with one person who wasn't who had cancer and i just wanted to cheer her up and it kind of grew to a bunch of people. And so I start by laughing. I'll find some stupid dog video or, you know, something that just, it <laughs> lightens my, you know, it's fun for me. And, you know, so I, I begin my day kind of in a light mood. And then I come, I'm, when I'm with my, well, my husband will then tell me about, oh, you know, something I don't want to hear in the news. And I, you know, we read that we both read the paper and look at the paper and I catch up on my emails and my messages and stuff. So it's it's really just basically chatter unless something's going on with somebody in our family that we need to, to be thinking about. Mm -hmm. um, well, it's not oh, nothing br nothing brilliant, but um, I and nothing consistent. It's well, whatever my whatever is, the mood. Oh my god, my husband is loves to talk about COVID, and he's so afraid I'm going to kill him because I go out and do things. Um, <laughs> uh, you but, laugh. Well, <laughs> he's vaccinated, right? well that it's not rational it's not rational it's just how he, it's he has oh, he's just fear. he has well, to obsess over he, something well, he's, <laughs> well he obsesses about his health and he's gonna outlive all of us for sure and he's quite a bit older than me but he's really he's he's really healthy he's so is it he, just genetics for him or what what keeps him healthy? does he do anything that keeps him healthy? no no genetics well actually his genetics are, are against him and that's why i think he worries so much because all of his siblings, he had four siblings who all died of heart problems, but he hasn't got diabetes and he hasn't got heart problems. So he has, unfortunately, a different genetic uh, yeah. code than they had. But you still wind up fearful when that's in your history. Sure, sure. What was the turning point in your professional life? Was there a time, Jennifer, where you something uh, happened or you kind of just thought, you know what, I'm, I'm going to be okay. I'm good at this and, and I'm going to make it oh. in this profession. Well, I didn't know what your turning point was. I haven't gotten there yet. So for that turning point, I don't, I don't feel like I you still I, don't feel that. No, I, I, it's funny. I was talking to my sister the other day about our definition of success. I feel like it, it can't be from me from external. It has to be a feeling the, of satisfaction with what I've done. Um, you know, I, you know, when most, my husband's a businessman, so, you know, they, they measure success with, you know, how much money you make, things like that. I can't think of it in those terms. When I was a therapist, if I could be helpful to somebody, that's how I had to value what I did. Um, but I've, I've, I feel like, um, kind of a phony. I don't, people look at me and see some uh, more success than I feel. It's, I have to, I feel, I mean, I'm happy about my book. I don't, I don't feel like I have to apologize for it. And if anybody wants to criticize it, I say, well, go ahead. Will you try? <laughs> mm -hmm. That's fine. All right. You, you try doing it. Okay. Then you can criticize me. Right. Um, but 
I think that the that's biggest... the imposter syndrome, right? I mean, that that's uh, yes, you learned about I, that in psychology. That's normal uh, for people, you know, even presidents and CEOs of the major companies of the world say, mm -hmm. what have I really done with my life? And people are going to figure out, I don't really know what I'm doing. Well, it's an awful feeling and I've always felt it. And it's, it's not, I just, I don't know. It's, I guess I'm going to die with it. Um, but, but it also keeps, does it drive you as well? Does it help drive your um, no. produ productivity oh. and creativity? No, no, it just makes me put myself down a lot and that annoys people because, because people buy a certain image without knowing what's underneath it. But I, I think the biggest turning point in my life really more than anything had to do with um, it was when I was in theater producing and I don't know how long it was, but my youngest child was having, she had certain issues that were challenging for all of us. And I think I, I had to, I mean, at that point I was, you know, I'd raised a lot of kids. I had my parents. I was, I think there was a moment where I almost lost sight of my priorities. Um, oh my God. I can't believe this is like true confessions <laughs> um, that I'm saying this, but, I had to really kind of reorder what was the mo my most important thing to my life is the health and well-being of my family above everything else. It's all, I mean, listen, if, if my kids all, they're all really good people and they all like each other. And we have a unity that, I mean, not, of course, I'm not putting a halo over. We have plenty of, you know, conflict also, but I mean, the thing I'll feel the best about, I guess, is the family I've created where they not, I didn't grow up with cousins that I knew. My kids all have cousin networks. They travel together. They're all great friends. That's what I feel good about. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. so it's like a shift in my thinking as to what really matters. And, and, you know, my career is my kind of my dessert, I guess, my gravy. It's, I don't, I'm not self-supporting. If I didn't have, if my husband didn't make the money he makes, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing. My life would be very different. So I can't measure what I do in terms of success in that sense. Well, but let me I, ask, oh, go ahead. No, but I, I mean, I'm proud of my family. Why did you decide to have five children? <laughs> Was it something that you knew at the time? I mean, did you always feel that you wanted to be a mother uh, sometimes it's a husband that's to drive around that. I want to have children. And and well, here you are right in the middle of uh, the women's lib movement also. And I'm sure that had an impact on you. Well, I was, I, it came, the women's movement came after I already had a few children. Okay, that's but good. I, my husband <laughs> wanted a lot of kids and I did too. I mean, I had, I am in the middle of three sisters, but we were, we were like five separate spheres growing up in many ways. We all just kind of did our own thing. And, and I had most of my my real connections were with friends. I had a friend. Uh, my friend Lisa had one of these his, hers, and ours family. Mm -hmm. And her father, her father was George McCready, who was Father Peyton in the Peyton place. And he was he was a movie star. He was in uh, Gilda. He was in he was in a, oh Paths of Glory. He was in a few very well known movies. And and she was one of three kids from her mother's first marriage. Then her mother married a man who had uh, two children and his wife had died. So then there were five kids and then they had two more. And I would go to their house and it was the most fun. <laughs> it was just, you know, just kind of craziness all over the place. And I love that. And God knows we have chaos in this house because every every Sunday I kind of I cook and see who comes and it could be anywhere from four people to 20 to 30. I don't know. I never know who's going to come. <laughs> you never know how to shop for and that. Yeah, and kids, I mean, kids running all over the place. I mean, my house is, I mean, it's, it's really pretty kid proof in every way. I mean, it's crazy. I have my grandchildren are from the youngest is five and the oldest is 33. And actually his wife's pregnant. <laughs> so there's going to be another addition to the family. And it's just fun. It's it's a oh, lot yeah. of fun. So I I mean it's really it's craziness. In fact, my older daughter, who's has had some of her childhood friends growing over to come over, they've come over a couple of times on a Sunday. This has been a long time since they came, but they'd see everybody kind of you know running up and down the stairs and climbing walls. And she said, "Oh my God, it's just like the old days." 
so it is it's it's a lot of fun and it's well i told you i grew up in a big italian family and as frustrating as it could be at times it's just a lot of fun to have people around and doing things and arguing and all that stuff no my kids are i mean it's really fun and i and i i feel really good i mean i just feel sunday nights i love it when they leave and then i sit and i think about it all and i just enjoy it i feel really good that this is what we've created so finish a sentence uh, for me. If you want to live the creative life, you need to be prepared to what? Well, well, I I think you have to be prepared to understand that it's it's not just pouring out your brilliant ideas. Like everybody thinks they have an idea for a movie, but it's hard work. It, and in order to be successful, it's collaborative. And just to be open, to be open to other people and to perspective and to be, uh, to put your ego aside. Mm. Let mean, me add, oh, go ahead. Finish that thought. No, it's just when I think of the collaborative nature of everything I've done, and I love working. I mean, when you work well with your collaborators, it's the best. And when you don't, it's the worst. So it's it's a, to me, working with other people is amazing. I really love it. And in fact, during the pandemic, my writer friends and I, we would often be on Zoom all day. We wouldn't even talk, maybe. But we were just there as a resource. Keeping company. Yes. Keeping company. That's a, uh, that, that's well, actually why I ask you about your husband and breakfast and, and do you, or is it just being in in your presence, uh, in each other's presence? Because sometimes that's what people really want is we don't necessarily have to talk, but I just want you to be here. Uh, no, I love it. I mean, with yeah, it's, I love the domesticity of it. My dogs are on the side and barking with my husband for him to give them table food, which he does, which I don't like. And, <laughs> you have dogs and cats, okay? Yeah, I have dogs and cats, and I, I, you know, just I've kind of settled into the domesticity of it and really enjoying it. Let me ask you a final question here, uh, and I'm going to ask this question because it, I think, falls right into line with your novel. Uh, you're if you're having a dinner party at your home and you can invite any three people, living or oh. dead, who would those three guests be? Wow, that's like the New York Times book review does every time as to who they would invite. Yes. Oh. So you know about that. But, so yeah, you may have contemplated this in the past. No, I think it's I'm very bad at those type of answers. Do you <laughs> want to laugh? Do you want to cry? Do you want to? be uh, mentally fortified uh, of course most of us I want all bring, of the above well you know the people i would want to bring it's a very sentimental answer and it's not an intellectual answer but you know now that i've written this book and it's funny my father always used to say well who's going to write the great american novel well i haven't written the great american novel but i have written a novel and i really wish my parents were alive I would bring back my parents. That's mm. two people. I, mm-hmm. I mean, I oh my God, I'm going to cry. It's, you know, I think about them a lot. How long have they been gone? My father died in 98 and my mother in 2000. So it's been, it's been, I was, I was almost 60 before I lost my parents. What, what were their ages when they died? Oh, my mother was 94. And my father was 95. Wow. Wow. Yeah, you yeah, come from we, good I've genes seen, and they lived full lives. Well, I've seen old age and that's why I could write about Bet with uh, pretty mm-hmm. much with my eyes wide open because I'm, old age is not so pretty. Fortunately, we're not having that kind of an old age, my husband and I, but it it's, can be challenging. But and who would be the third person? I don't know. Maybe my godmother because she knew my parents all my life and I would tell my parents to, to go off for a walk or something. And then I would find out all the things I didn't know about my parents. Well, I got to tell you, Jennifer, this has been a lot of fun. I really enjoyed visiting with you. You are so fluid with the conversation. You, you are willing to answer anything. You're very open. And, um, 
Uh, this has been a lot of fun. I uh, thank you for taking the time. I wish you best of luck with Alphabet thank you. Thank as well you. as with your movie and your new novel, which uh, um, well, is not, untitled at this point. No, oh, yeah, it's nowhere near that. No, okay. I have to. I have to stop doing podcasts to write it. <laughs> well, you know, the podcast will help with the sales of the book, the first one, and then uh, you can do your next round. No, when yeah, well, when the movie comes out, maybe you'll invite me back. Yeah, because, just keep keep me posted for sure, because, or have Saeed, because, your publicist, uh, keep me posted. Well, he's not, he's well, yeah, he's been he's been lovely, but yeah, I'm very proud of the movie. See, I well, just I said something nice it. about what I've done, but the, but the director, oh my God, we just got lucky. We have an amazing amazing group of people, very talented group of people made this movie. Well, it's, I'm it, looking forward to seeing it. Boundary Boundary Waters, is that right? Right. Right. Henry Waters. Good luck getting in the film festivals and then getting a, you know, a rocket launch to, you know, hundreds of screens across the United States. <laughs> well, uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Jennifer, for, uh, thank you coming for having on the podcast. me. Mike. Thank you so much. This was, I enjoyed it as well. And I hope I'm not going to be sorry about everything I said. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 